In this lecture, we're just going to be doing a bunch of problems uh, relating to mass spring systems. And the idea is we're going to try to apply as much of the theory we learned in the previous lecture as we can. So here's the first problem. Um, hanging a one kilogram mass from a string, a spring, uh, stretches a spring this length, 2.5 meters from its unloaded length. And there is no damping present. That's going to be important. Um, and we'd like to know with what initial velocity should the mass be pushed from its resting position in order to oscillate with an amplitude of four meters. Okay. And also what is the angular frequency of the motion? Okay, well, let's uh, look at this first part. Um, so we are hanging a one kilogram mass from a spring. And so maybe I'll draw the spring without the mass first. And then when we hang the mass, it's actually going to stretch the spring like this. So here's my mass. And it has stretched it a length um, of 2.5 meters. So this is 2.5 meters. Let's call that capital L. Okay. Okay. Um, well, uh, if you recall the beginning of last lecture, this is actually exactly the information we need to find the spring constant. So we were not given the spring constant in this problem. Um, but what can we do here? So what we can do is um, write down the forces acting on this mass. So we have the force due to gravity, which is mg. g is the gravitational constant. And we have the spring force. And recall the spring force is proportional to exactly this length here, the length, um, the displacement from equilibrium. So this is the force due to gravity. This is the force due to the spring. Um, if we call downward the positive direction, and this one's going to have a negative sign, and it'll be negative 2.5 um, times my spring constant k. Okay, well, we know what everything is except for k, and also we know that the net force is zero because it's just sitting there. It's not accelerating or anything like that. So we know that uh, zero is going to be the sum of these two. So mg, what is mg? m is 1. g, let's estimate g at 10. It's 9.8 uh, meters per second squared. So it's 10. Uh, yeah. so it's 1 times 10. Um, minus 2.5k, and that's equal to 0. Well, that tells us that k is about 4. Okay, great. Well, what's the point of that? Well, now we can actually write down our differential equation. All right, so our differential equation for the spring, because there's no damping, it's just going to have m y double prime plus k y. There's no y prime term. So that's our differential equation for the mass spring system we have here. Um, okay, what next? Well, we need to find what initial velocity should the mass be pushed from its resting position. It's being pushed from its resting position. That's actually telling us that uh, we're going to be at rest initially. So y of 0 is 0, and y prime of 0, if we're writing down our initial value problem here, um, well, isn't this exactly what we want to find? That's the initial velocity. So I'll just call that something. I'll call that v, maybe v0, for initial velocity. Okay. This is often a useful idea. If we're trying to find something and we're not sure how to proceed in the problem, just give it a name and then uh, try, to, uh, try to solve the in this case, yeah, we're going to try to solve this initial value problem. Um, okay, well, m is 1, k is 4. So our differential equation is actually um, this, y equals 0. And, um, well, what is the angular frequency in the motion? I think we can figure that out right away. That's actually not going to depend on the initial conditions, if you recall. And the formula we got from the last lecture square root of k over m. What is that going to be? Uh, square root of 4 over 1 is 2. So our angular frequency is 2. Um, and our solution, if we just skip ahead to this, it's going to be uh, c1, our general solution. It's going to be c1 cosine of exactly this, the angular frequency. That's the number that ends up in the cosine. So cosine 2t plus c2 sine 2t. Okay. 
That's our general solution. Okay. Uh, what next? Well, let's plug in our initial conditions. So y of 0 equaling 0, what is that telling us? That's telling us that uh, 0 is going to equal, plug in 0 for t as well. This one just becomes 0. Um, and we get 1 for the cosine. So we just get 0 equals c1. Interesting. So actually our equation just has a sign term. It only has a sign term. It's a pure sign. Um, okay, let's go ahead and plug this in, even though we don't really know uh, what this v0 is. Let's still plug it in. So y prime of 0 is v0. And what do we get? So we're going to plug that in for y of t. And uh, again, we're plugging in 0 for this. Um, or, um, yeah, we're, we're plugging in 0 for uh, t, but we need to take the derivative, right? So y prime of t is uh, 2 c2 cosine 2 t, right? So we got 2 c2 cosine 2 t. Now we're plugging in 0 for t, we get uh, 1 for the cosine. So v0 is um, 2 times c2. So in particular, c2 equals 1 half of my v0, my initial velocity. So let's go ahead and write that. C2 is 1 half V0 times sine of 2T. Okay. Um, well, what, what do we need to do? So we've already done all of the problem except for this part. What is that initial velocity that will cause the mass to oscillate with an amplitude of 4 meters? Okay. What is the amplitude? Isn't the amplitude just this right here? Okay. We just have a pure sign, so the amplitude is just going to be that uh, number in front. So that's going to be 4 meters. That tells me v0 has to be 8. So that's our answer. Um, and here's our, here's our omega, our angular frequency. Um, in general, the amplitude is... So, so for, for this, uh, this general solution here, in general, our amplitude is going to be a more complicated formula. Right, because we can write, we can always write this as a single sine or a cosine, but that amplitude in front is going to be c1 squared plus c2 squared. Okay. In this case, it turned out that one of these c's was just, was just zero. Right, so this formula just becomes a equals the other one. Um, okay. So it's an example of an undamped mass spring system. This is also called simple harmonic motion, by the way. We just get um, sines and cosines. We have no damping. Okay, let's look at the next problem. So in this one, we have a block of unknown mass m, and it's attached to a spring with this spring constant and this damping coefficient. So we do have damping in this problem. Um, and when a block is pushed, it's going to oscillate back and forth, but the amplitude is going to decrease over time. That makes a lot of sense because we do have some damping going on here. It's not going to be a pure oscillation like the previous problem. Um, using a timer, you determine that the block crosses the equilibrium position once every pi over two seconds. Okay. What is the unknown mass m? That's what we have to find. Well... Let's try to write down what we know. So we know k and gamma. So we can write down our mass spring differential equation, but uh, we don't know m. So I'm just going to leave it as, as symbol m. I'll go ahead and fill in uh, gamma and k. And um, you know, we can go ahead and solve this. So uh, m, our squared m writing down the characteristic polynomial and the roots are going to look like this by the quadratic formula. I get 3 plus or minus, uh, let's see, 9 minus 24m over, that's gamma squared minus 4mk um, over 2m. Okay. Well, we have the symbol m kind of showing up, so it's not really clear where to go from here. We do actually have some extra information, which makes this problem interesting. So what do we know? We have a description of the motion. So let me try to sketch out what it's saying. Um, 
about the motion here. So I'm going to draw a graph of this motion. And uh, yes, we have t and y of t. Well, something like this. So it's oscillating, but the amplitude of the oscillations is decreasing over time. So, so something like this. Um, what case are we talking about here? Is this undamped? Well, certainly not undamped, but is it underdamped, critically damped, overdamped? Pause the video and try to think for yourself. Okay, so hopefully you came to the conclusion that this is underdamped. So under, in the under, underdamped case, we still have oscillations, and that's associated with complex roots, right? That's where the oscillations come from. As it, it, we're going to get sines and cosines in the general solution, okay? But there's also going to be a decaying exponential being multiplied. So let's um, let's use that information. So we know because of the description of the motion, there will be complex roots, okay? We know... Uh, in other words, we know that this thing right here is negative. That thing inside the square root of the discriminant. Okay? And again, this is based on the description of the motion. We know we're in the underdamped case. Um, okay, well, let's go ahead and use that information to rewrite these roots as... Um, same, same idea in the, in the previous video. We're going to factor out our negative 1, and we get square root of negative 1, which is i... But this now becomes 24m minus 9 over 2m. And what do we know about this here? Well, I'm not going to drive, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to go through the whole process again, but um, if you recall from the last video, this becomes the number inside the sines and the cosines. In other words, this becomes the frequency, or I should say quasi-frequency. This isn't just square root of uh, square root of k over m. There's some damping, so the, remember the formula for the frequency is more complicated in that case. So that right there is my quasi frequency. Um, what are we given? Is 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 this saying the quasi frequency is pi over two? What is this pi over two saying? Well, it's crossing the equilibrium position, so. It's crossing the equilibrium position every pi over two seconds. This is pi over two, this distance here. Or it's, it's not really a distance, it's a time, right? Pi over two seconds. We know there's something called the period, right? That period is the distance for a full cycle or between two peaks. So this is the period T. I should probably say quasi-period. Um... But this pi over 2, we have to be careful. This is actually only half of a period. Right? It's not a full cycle. The period is one full cycle, or the distance between two peaks. So this pi over 2 is actually going to be half the period. So I know that my period is actually pi in this problem. So I'm given that essentially a half period is pi over 2. Okay. Um, well, what is the frequency? Well, recall the period is... The period is uh, 2 pi over our frequency. So our frequency, quasi-frequency, is t the period, uh, uh, sorry, the, uh, 2 pi over the period, which is 2 pi over pi, which is 2. <laughs> so we're, based on this information we're given, this last sentence here, we can figure out that the quasi-frequency is actually 2. At the same time, it's that number right there, right? We have a formula for the quasi-frequency. So <laughs> we know that 2 equals this thing. Interesting. Um, well, it looks like we can now solve this for our unknown mass m, right? There are two m's here, though, so it's a little bit tricky to solve. I think the way we're going to do it, probably, uh, yeah, just move the 2m over. And then get rid of the square root. So uh, yeah, let's move the 2m over like this. And then we want to square both sides. You always want to get rid of a square root if you can. So here we get 16m squared equals 24m minus 9. Ah, that's a quadratic equation. We have another quadratic equation. 
Um, so if we solve this quadratic equation, looks like we're going to have to do two quadratic equations in this problem. Um, but the solution to this quadratic equation will be our unknown mass m. And you can use a quadratic formula. Um, I'm noticing, I think this factors. So I think this is actually four. These are both squares. I think it's four um, m minus three. And yeah, we get exactly that 24 if we multiply this out. Uh, so, so it's 4m minus 3 squared, uh, which tells me m equals 3 fourths. It's a double root to this quadratic. Uh, what are our units? Kilograms. So our mass is uh, 3 quarters of a kilogram. You can also use a quadratic formula here. Okay, uh, so this is a good example of the underdamped case where you have decaying oscillations. Okay. And the important uh, quantities are the quasi-frequency, which is the imaginary part of the root, and the quasi-period, which is 2 pi over the quasi-frequency. OK, uh, the next problem, we would like to design a shock absorber for a car. So a shock absorber, uh, that acts very much like a damping device. OK? so. Um, it's going to dampen the, the motion um, of the car. And we know that the car has a mass of 1,000 kilograms. Um, okay, so that's our mass. Let's go ahead and write that down. Okay, uh, before the shock absorber was installed, the car is actually going to bounce up and down. So there's no damping in this case. It's before we install the uh, damping device. The car is going to bounce up and down with an angular frequency of 3 radians per second. Okay, so yeah, let's just first consider we have the undamped case. That's going to change because we're, we're going to install this device. But uh, the undamped motion, we have a angular frequency of 3 radians per second. Um, and we want to know what is the minimum value of a damping constant that can be used to eliminate oscillations. Ah, so if you've seen the last video, you might already have an idea for this. What's the smallest value of a damping constant that can be used to eliminate oscillations? Um, and it looks like we'd also like to figure out how high the car will rise above equilibrium position when it hits a bump. The bump gives it a velocity of one meter per second. Okay, uh, well, before we do anything, let's uh, try to leverage this um, omega equals three uh, to figure out what we don't know. So we're in an undamped case. There's no damping, but we have a frequency what is that frequency? That frequency is also square root of k over m, right? We know what m is, we can find k. So we're writing down what we know and then realizing what we can actually, so m is, is 1,000. That tells us actually k equals 9,000. Okay. Um, can we figure out anything else? Well, um, we have all we need to know uh, for this first part, but now we want to introduce damping, and we're trying to find the damping constant. Okay, that's what we're that's what we're looking for. Um, okay, what's the minimum value of the damping constant going to be to eliminate oscillations? Um, well, when are we going to get oscillations? Oscillations. we saw in the last video, that's when gamma squared minus 4mk is less than zero, right? And when, and in fact, when there's no damping, we just get pure oscillations. If there is some damping, we get decaying oscillations, like in the previous problem. Okay. And there are no oscillations in the other case. So this is underdamped. Um, there are no oscillations when gamma squared minus 4mk is actually greater or equal to. Even when it's equal to zero, we saw that's the critically damped case. You don't, you, you get no oscillations, okay? And if you just stare at this, you realize that that's actually going to be the smallest value of gamma, right? So we want, if gamma gets any smaller than the value that makes this equal to zero, then you're gonna get something negative, right? So we, we actually want the gamma so that we want the value of gamma that makes this exactly equal to zero, 
In other words, we want the critically damped case. It's called a critically damped case. Okay. So, I, and this is a very practical thing. Like we want the car to actually return to equilibrium position pretty fast, but we don't want it to bounce back and forth. Okay, and that's exactly what you get when you choose gamma to be such that this is zero. Uh, okay, well, this is great. So we know M and K, we found K in that first part of the problem. So we can find gamma. So gamma squared minus four MK. Uh, what is M and what is K? It's four times what? 1,000 times 9,000. That's 36 million, which I guess is a, a square. So that's 6,000 squared. So, so that tells me gamma actually equals 6,000. Okay. Um, great. So that is the minimum value of the damping constant that we want. Very important value of gamma for this problem. Um, now we'd like to figure out well, what about, okay, once we actually install that damping uh, system, how high will the car rise above equilibrium position when it hits a bump? Okay, so we're starting at equilibrium position. Let, well, let's go ahead and write down our differential equation, All right? So we have um, M is going to be the critically damped case. So we have M uh, Y double prime plus uh, this gamma 6,000. Again, yeah, that 6,000 is a value that makes it critically damped. Um, sorry, what's my K? 9,000. There's our differential equation. Uh, let's go ahead and divide by 1,000. Y prime plus nine Y equals zero. Um, well, can we see what our roots are <laughs> for the characteristic polynomial? So our characteristic polynomial is going to be R squared um, plus 6r plus 9. That's r plus 3 squared. So r is going to be minus 3. And that's a repeated root, just like we expected. right? If we hadn't gotten a, a repeated root here, we, we would have known we, we'd, we'd done something wrong because we're expecting a repeated root for the critically damped case. Um, okay, what's our general solution? It's going to look like uh, c1 e to the minus 3t plus c2 t e to the minus 3t. Okay. And so why am I uh, trying to write down uh, the equation for the motion? Because uh, see, what we're going to have to do is yeah, figure out how high the car will rise. So we need to figure out how large this can get, how large this can get right here when it hits a bump. So what is, what, what's happening with the bump? Uh, well, y of zero is, so yeah, we're assuming it's not moving before that. So Suppose y of zero is zero. But then we, when we hit a bump, the problem says that it gives a vertical velocity of one. Okay, so well, well, what am I looking at here? I'm, you draw a graph via this motion. Okay, I don't know what C1 and C2 are yet. I can figure those out, but um, I'm just gonna draw what I think is going on here based on the description. So the car's gonna hit a bump. That's immediately going to cause it to rise and then it's going to sort of fall back down toward equilibrium position. Okay. But it's not going to oscillate back and forth, right? That's the key. Just gonna go back to the equilibrium. Um, yeah, so this is what we want, right? We want this y value here, where we're at a, um, where we're at a maximum here, where our function y of t is at a maximum. Let's finish finding y of t first, um, and then we'll figure out how to find this maximum. We're gonna have to use some calculus probably. So if we plug in y of zero equals zero, what is that telling us? Telling us zero equals, this just becomes zero. This becomes one. So we just get zero equals C1. C1 equals zero. Okay, uh, that's nice. So we only have to deal with this second part. Now we wanna plug this one in. I need to take the derivative first, All right? Um, it's a product rule. Um, that minus three is gonna come down. So minus three C two T e to the minus three T. And Y prime of zero, we know is one. What's that going to tell us? Hmm, uh, that's going to tell us that one equals C two um, 
ah, minus zero, right? Because there's a T there. So C2 is equal to one. So here's my function. Uh, it's just T e to the minus three T. That's the function that describes the motion of the car. Why do I need this? Because uh, I need to find its maximum value. And if you recall uh, from calculus, how do we find this maximum value? Well, we take advantage of the fact, this is one of the beautiful ideas in calculus, at the maximum of this uh, smooth function here, my derivative is going to be zero, okay? So I know that y prime is going to be zero here for whatever this value of t is. Let's try to find that value of t, then we'll plug it in our function again to find the maximum. So to find critical points, so we wanna find the critical points. We set our derivative, our derivative is uh, this thing here. <laughs> so we're gonna set that equal to zero. Well, what is that? It's just a C, again, C2 is one. So just e to the minus three t minus three t, e to the minus three t. And we want that to be zero. When is this zero? Well, we can factor out the e to the minus three t. And e to the minus three t is never zero. So we wanna know when this is zero. This is never zero. We have a product of this times uh, this part here. This part is zero and t equals one third. Okay, so that is this t value here, or at least a candidate for yeah, this t value, but this is the only critical point and you can show it as a maximum. Um, oh, but we're not done yet. What is that actual maximum? So the maximum y value, the maximum height we rise above the equilibrium position is uh, we just take our function, our, our position function and plug in one third. So we get one third e to the minus three times one third, which is one third e to the minus one, or we can write like this if we want. Okay, so that's pretty cool that we, uh, the number e is uh, showing up here, um, as often happens. Okay, so this problem actually goes through uh, several different concepts. So we see the undamped motion here. We had to use uh, this formula for omega to figure out our spring constant. And then very important part of the problem, we needed to find the minimum value of a damping constant that eliminates oscillations. And that's associated with a critically damped case. That's when gamma squared minus 4mk is exactly equal to zero. And then finally, we wrote down the differential equation, found the position function of the car, and then found its maximum value using some calculus. Okay, so a lot going on in that problem. Uh, let's look at the next problem. This is the last problem we'll do in this lecture, um, but hopefully you'll find it interesting. So um, show that the mass in a mass, a mass spring dash pot system subject to some initial conditions. Okay, so we just have some initial conditions. Um, it'll cross the equilibrium position either there, there are only three possibilities. So it will either cross infinitely many times, once, or not at all. Um, so that's kind of interesting. So in particular, it cannot cross twice. It cannot cross exactly twice. So, so I'm gonna draw an example of, you know, I mean, you might imagine that a mass spring system can do something like this. this could, the motion could look something like that, and then it returns to the equilibrium position. That's pretty reasonable, um, but apparently this cannot happen because it crosses twice there. And this problem is claiming that you can only cross it once. You can cross the equilibrium position once, zero times, or infinitely many times. Those are the only possibilities. Um, and we have to show that this is true. So, well, hmm. how are we going to do this? Well, we can write down our mass spring differential equation, but we're not really sure where to proceed or how to proceed because we have to consider sort of all of these equations at once and even all initial conditions at once. Um, so, well, what do we have to do? Um, 
let's try to translate this into more mathematical uh, language. So what do we mean by cross equilibrium position? We want, um, we want y of t to cross the equilibrium uh, to, to be zero essentially, right? We, so, so what, what are we saying? We're saying the number of zeros of, you know, whatever my solution is, my various solutions. Um, so the number of zeros of y of t, um, this is my position function, is either is either zero uh, zeros, <laughs> one zero, or infinitely many. Okay, that's what we're trying to show. So we are going to need to write down some y of t's. We're need we're going to need to write down all of them. Um, but we have a way of organizing um, the various cases, right? So I think what we we should do is we should look at all the cases that we looked at in a previous video. Because in each case, the solution looks pretty much the same. You might have different arbitrary constants, but um, you have the same kind of solutions. So what are our cases? We have the undamped case and the underdamped case. Let's do those first. So what do we want to do? We want to try to write down the undamped and underdamped solutions and see that they actually have either no zeros, one zero, or infinitely many zeros. Well, uh, I think we can do that. So what is the undamped solution? It's C1 times cosine omega t plus C2 times sine omega t, right? What is omega in terms of these three things? Well, it's square root of k over m. Um, let's go ahead and write down the underdamped case as well. So, um, in the underdamped case, we have uh, C1, we, we get this exponential, right? So we get e to the, um, what is that number going to be? I think it was, um, without having the thing in front of me, I think it was minus gamma over 2m t times a cosine of omega t plus C2. Again, have this number in the exponential times a sine, right? And in this case, the omega is not square root of k over m, so be careful about that. So this omega is actually um, 4mk minus gamma squared over 2m, the quasi-frequency. Okay. Um, but it's not going to matter too much because uh, what do we know about these, uh, these equations? Well, first of all, I mean, this first one is just a pure sine or cosine, right? Because we can rewrite this if we want in the form a times cosine omega t minus v, where a is the square root of c1 squared plus c2 squared. And it's just a cosine, right? That's going to have infinitely many zeros, okay? Same with the second one. If we want, we can rewrite it as, um, sorry, I wanted to put a there. We can rewrite this as some amplitude. Again, that's going to be C, uh, square root of C1 squared plus C2 squared. We can factor out the exponential part and we can write this as a single cosine. Okay. Um, we wanna know when is this zero, right? Like this one too, when is that zero? Um, well, in this case, yeah, we know cosine has infinitely many zeros. In this case, we have this exponential, but th this is never zero. Exponential is never going to be zero. So we actually want to know when the cosine is zero, and that occurs at infinitely many values of t. Okay. So both of these cases, the solutions always have infinitely um, many, let's call it equilibrium crossings. And that makes sense because they're both uh, oscillations, right? We get oscillations in both of those. Okay, uh, we have two more cases though. So what about the critically damped case? Well, what happens in that case? We have uh, the following general solution. We have C1 e to the, um, again, it's yeah, negative, uh, yeah, it's negative gamma over 2m again, uh, t plus C2t e to the negative gamma over 2mt. Okay. 
and we want to know again yeah how many zeros does this have so for yeah when, when is this equal to zero for how many values of t okay um well what can we do we can use the typical idea which is factoring and we're going to try to write this as a product so I'll factor out the exponential. It's the same exponential in both cases. And I get C1 plus C2t. Again, the exponential, never zero. But I have a product of two things equaling zero. That means this part here has to be zero. When does that happen? That happens when uh, t is, let's see, minus C1 over C2. In particular, for any initial conditions, for any C1 and C2, we only get one value of t, right? There's just one value of t where our function has a value zero, right? Okay. Um, well, you might, you might protest and say, well, wait a second, we divided by C2 here. What if C2 happened to be zero, right? That can, that can happen where C2 is zero. Well, and in that case, we, we can't divide by C2. <laughs> um, but if C2 is zero, then we just get this exponential times a C1, and that's never going to be zero. So we actually, uh, in we're either going to get, yeah, once or not at all <laughs> in this case, um, if that makes sense. All right, so, so let me just write that out. Uh, so if, um, if the C2 is not equal to zero, there's one uh, equilibrium crossing. And we can say exactly when it is. It's at uh, t equals minus c1 over c2. And again, these c1 and c2 are just dependent on whatever the initial conditions are. Oh, but if, c, but if c2 does equal zero, there's no crossings. Okay, so what have we shown? We've shown that if it's critically damped, we can only get at most one crossing, okay? That's that number right there. Um, okay, we have one more case, but then, um, wait, not under damped, over damped. So the over damped case, but then after that, we're done. If we can show that for the over damped case, we could only get you know one of these possibilities here. We're done because this covers all the possible cases. Right? It covers all the possible values of gamma squared minus four mk. Okay? Um, okay, so what does the overdamp solution look like? Part of the reason why I'm doing this problem, by the way, is uh, it basically gives us a chance to review everything, <laughs> all the different uh, forms of the solutions. So that one, we get C1 e to the R1t plus C2 e to the R2t. I'm not gonna write down what R1 and R2 are. Um, if you remember from the last lecture, they're complicated formulas using quadrat the quadratic formula, but it's when you get two real roots to the quadratic, uh, the quadratic uh, formula. And you can actually show that uh, these R1 and R2 can actually be any two negative numbers. There's some mass spring system where you'll get R1 and R2 to be any two negative numbers that you want. Um, okay, when is this zero? Hmm. Um, this one looks trickier to solve. What are we trying to do? We're trying to find the values of t. How many values of t are there so that this equals zero? Um, ah, so I have an idea. Let's try to factor, even though we don't know what r1 and r2 are. Let's pull out this e to the r1t anyway. So what do we have left? We have c plus, uh, c1 plus, uh, this is a different number here, right? This r2. But um, I can write this as c2 times e to the r2t divided by e to the r1t, because I pulled that out. Uh, but that's just e to the r2 minus r1t by exponential properties. Okay. So yeah, when is this equal to zero? Well, certainly this part is never zero. So we're looking for when this second part is equal to zero. So we want um, we want zero to equal C1 plus C2 
It's a little more complicated than the previous case. We have e to the r2 minus r1t here. Okay, uh, let's solve for t and see how many solutions we get. So uh, move the c1 over, divide by c2. That's e to the r2 minus r1t. Um, okay, what do we do next? Take the natural log. equals r2 minus r1t, so t is going to be this natural log times 1 over r2 minus r1. Okay, in particular, uh, sorry, in particular, I only wrote down one value of t. That's just one value of t there. So there's at most one value of t where we're going to cross the equilibrium, and it's exactly this value here. Or r1 and r2 are the roots. c1 and c2 are dependent on the initial conditions. Um, sometimes this is not going to work, right? <laughs> so for example, if C2 is zero, then we can't get a solution. If this number inside the natural logarithm is a negative number, which it looks like it is going to be, uh, as long as C1 and C2, I guess, have the same sign, this also doesn't work. You cannot take the logarithm of a natural number, uh, of a, neg a negative number. So we're not going to get a value of T in that case. Um, but, uh, yeah, so if C1 and C2 have different signs, then that's going to be positive. Then there's one equilibrium crossing. And it's that value of T that I just wrote a formula for. There's only one. Um... We'll say otherwise, there are no crossings. Um, I should also say, like, this value of t might be negative. So, like, in practice, like, even if we get 1, uh, if you start at time equals 0, you might not actually get a crossing. So, let's try to summarize this. So, over damped, we get either 0 or 1 crossings. Here, so 0 or 1 crossings. Critically damped, we get either 0 or 1 crossings. We can never get a picture like this in the overdamped or critically damped case. But then if we're underdamped or uh, undamped, we get infinitely many crossings. Okay, and those are the only four cases, right? So we just we just proved that uh, we can all, there are only three possibilities. You either cross, cross the equilibrium position once, infinitely many times, or not at all. Okay, so that was a tricky problem. But um, it uh, was a good review, I think, of the various um, cases. Okay, we had to go through all the cases.